Hey guys, thank you all so much for praying for my mother-in-law, son, and for me and my wife. My mother-in-law is doing better and they are going to move her from the ICU to a regular room. My son's surgery went well and since his appendix didn't rupture, he was allowed to go home a few hours after surgery. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The love you all have shown is a testament that you are Jesus' disciples. Praise God for brothers and sisters like you. I love you guys, the Watchmen. Welcome to the Watchmen channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless and michigan democratic governor gretchen whitmer is facing criticism for her not saying the word woman listen to this i have the constitutional ability to bring a lawsuit to protect constitutional rights of people of michigan so i brought a lawsuit on behalf of all the menstruating people in michigan 2.2 million Kevin Rinke is a Republican candidate looking to take Whitmer's position as Michigan's governor. So for the side that wants to follow science with everything else, they refuse to say woman. Um, you have other Democrats saying things that also don't make sense. Uh, she's not the only one as far as Rep. Uh, Cori Bush calling them birthing people. I want to listen to this and then we're going to talk about it. I am committed to doing the absolute most to protect black mothers, to protect black babies, to protect protect black birthing people. None of this is about supporting life. What this is about is controlling women's bodies. This is about making sure that someone like me as a woman or any menstruating person in this country cannot make decisions over their own body. I find it offensive as a woman when they call it birthing people. When you hear things like this from uh, Governor Whitmer saying menstruating people, I mean, it's almost like women are being the ones attacked right now. Am I, am I right? I don't understand it. I, I mean, there's men and there's women. And why we are spending time talking about menstruating people is beyond me. I think it, what it does is it pushes people to think how crazy these people are. The unsaved hold the view there is no right or wrong. Therefore, whatever feels or seems right at the time and in that situation is right. Christians hold the view that there are indeed absolute realities and standards that define what is true and what is not. To the unsaved, tolerance has become the one cardinal virtue of the postmodern society, the one absolute, and therefore, intolerance is the only evil. Any dogmatic belief, especially a belief in absolute truth, is viewed as intolerance, the ultimate sin to an unbeliever. If there is absolute truth, then there are absolute standards of right and wrong, and we are accountable to those standards. This accountability is what people are really rejecting when they reject absolute truth. The denial of absolute truth and the cultural relativism that comes with it are the logical result of a society that has embraced the theory of evolution as the explanation for life. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning, we have no purpose, and there cannot be any absolute right or wrong. Man is then free to live as he pleases and is accountable to no one for his actions. Yet, no matter how much sinful men deny the existence of God and absolute truth, they still will someday stand before God in judgment. The Bible declares this in Romans 1, 19 through 22, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Is there any evidence for the existence of absolute truth? Yes, 
there is the human conscience, that certain something within us that tells us the world should be a certain way, that some things are right and some things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us there is something wrong with suffering, pain, and evil, and it makes us aware that love, generosity, compassion, and peace are positive things for which we should strive. The Bible describes the role of the human conscience as we read in Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. Turning now to Afghanistan, where the Taliban-controlled government is asking for international help after yesterday's catastrophic earthquake that killed at least a thousand people, the deadliest quake to strike that country in two decades. Charlie Daggett reports now on the disaster, the rescue effort, and the death toll, which is unfortunately likely to rise. An orderly line of men prepare a row of graves for the victims of the earthquake. A stark contrast compared to one day earlier when rescuers were forced to dig with their bare hands in a desperate search for survivors. A lack of roads to the remote area meant shuttling the injured away by helicopter. At least 1,500 people have been injured, many left fighting for their lives. There was a rumbling and the bed began to shake, Shabir says. I'm sure seven or nine people from my family who were in the same room as me are dead. The earthquake struck one of the poorest regions of one of the poorest countries on the planet. Decades of conflict, government corruption and now crippling sanctions have brought Afghanistan to its knees and left the Taliban begging the international community for help. Many aid groups fled the country after last year's Taliban takeover. It's in a country that's already on the brink. We know that it's a uh, food security situation is where we're talking about we're close to a famine-like situation. People are really already hanging on by, by a threat. As the death toll climbs, even for thousands of survivors now made homeless and facing widespread hunger, the suffering has only begun. Severe drought and the collapse of the economy plagued the country with a high poverty rate and food shortages, a crisis that's gotten worse since the U.S. left and the Taliban took over. Um, there's a drought that's happening um, that's causing significant uh, food insecurity for the people here in Afghanistan, um, endemic and pandemic diseases that are affecting people's lives here. Um, it is a whole, uh, a long list of factors that are making life very difficult here for, um, for the Afghan people. The UN estimates 1.1 million children under the age of five could face severe malnutrition this year. NGOs are aiding the recovery effort on the ground. Well, UNICEF has several mobile health and nutrition teams on the ground at the moment. 
But even they admit that giving relief to Afghanistan's more remote villages will be a challenge without sophisticated equipment to support their response. Afghanistan is no stranger to earthquakes. In 1998, an earthquake killed at least 4,500 people in the Northeast. More deadly earthquakes would follow in 2002, 2005, 2009, 2015, and even earlier this year, in 2022. But this earthquake could become Afghanistan's most deadly in more than 20 years. Isaiah 24, 19 through 21. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. It shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. In southern China, entire villages have disappeared underwater. Record rainfall in recent weeks has caused several major rivers and tributaries to burst their banks in the provinces of Guangdong, Guangxi, Fujian and Jiangxi. Flood alerts have been raised to the highest levels. Rescue teams are working around the clock to move hundreds of thousands of people to higher ground and clear landslides triggered in mountainous areas. More than a thousand homes and farms have been destroyed, with the losses estimated at more than a quarter of a billion dollars. In urban areas, roads have become rivers, businesses and schools have closed, and public transport has been suspended. Heavy downpours are common along the Pearl River Delta at this time of year, but experts say climate change is causing more extreme and erratic weather patterns. We have to expect that monsoon rainfall will become stronger in the future. But at the same time, the climate models show that the variability from year to year and also the variability within one season intensifies too. As the rain moves northward, some counties have begun cleaning up. Emergency teams are moving debris and clearing blocked roads, but many areas are still without electricity. Last year, almost 400 people were killed in floods in central Henan province. The government was accused of being slow to respond to the so-called once-in-a-thousand-years downpour, and critics called for improvements to China's emergency warning systems. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. Shukar Ali is a livestock farmer who lost his home in the floods. He and his family have been living on the side of this road for almost a week now without any kind of help. Armed forces have rescued or evacuated more than 100,000 people from two of the worst hit districts in the Northeast. Many others are still stranded in remote rural areas. This is one of the many schools in Shunamgonj and Silet region that has been used as makeshift shelter for those villagers who were affected by the flood. Most of the people took shelter on their own. Now they're in desperate need for food and fresh water. Even residents in urban areas with better drainage systems are affected. We've never seen floods like this in our lifetime. Our home has water up to the hip. We've no running water and electricity. We're now using rainwater. During her visit to the area, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said future building developments should take into account the number of natural disasters that Bangladesh experiences. Many of these people are still recovering from the last month's pre-monsoon flash floods. We left our home to take shelter here. There's no food or fresh water. It would help if we got some relief from the government so we can get by. For the poor rural farmers who have lost everything, it'll take months, if not years, to rebuild their homes. They need all the assistance they can get, but help is yet to come.
With streets and homes partially submerged, this community in Indian-administered Kashmir is trying to stop things from getting worse. Heavy rainfall caused a canal in Budgam district to burst its banks. Now this neighborhood is bearing the brunt. We were sleeping and heard people's cries. Flood water started coming in. Many houses are damaged and even paddy fields are underwater. Damaged crops will mean a huge loss for us. Mubina says she feels helpless. All her belongings are damaged. Nothing much is left now. My nephew had a close call, but he was somehow safe from the floodwaters. It's so high, you can't even take out items from inside the house. Heavy rain and snowfall has triggered flash floods and landslide in recent days. Roads are blocked and cars stranded. Rescue teams have started moving people from low-lying areas to safer locations. One of the landslides covered an area of about 100 meters. If it doesn't rain in the next few days, it will take at least two days to clear the debris. Until that happens, families are doing what they can, stacking sandbags and putting up barriers to try and save what's left. The first week of summer shattering records as an unrelenting heat wave pushes into the southeast. Parts of Florida forecast to hit their first 100-degree day in three years. I'm trying to survive the heat. The same heat dome that buckled roads in Chicago killed thousands of cattle in Kansas. The extreme heat also contributing to the death of a five-year-old in Houston, left in a hot car for hours. The frequency of heat waves setting off a new federal framework to protect workers from the hazards of heat exposure. Expanded OSHA guidelines include building a tolerance to heat, drinking a cup of cool water every 15 minutes, with mandatory breaks in the shade to recover. How much harder is your work under these types of conditions? Oh, it's, it's real. Right? It's just hot. This is hot. You got to take it easy, pace yourself. At the University of North Florida, researchers are studying hot spots to set a baseline to shape future public health strategies. By midday here in Jacksonville, you can see on this thermal camera, surface temperatures soaring to dangerous levels, like right here in this parking lot where there's absolutely no shade. The heat heightening risks as the summer offers a preview of our new normal. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16, 21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat and they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Now, tens of thousands of children in Ethiopia are suffering from what has been described as the most deadly form of malnutrition. One of the factors that resulted in this situation is prolonged droughts. The Horn of Africa region has seen four consecutive rainy seasons fail, the conditions remaining the same for the fifth time in a row. And this has caused the worst drought in 40 years. Not only this, a major hunger crisis is expected to follow in Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia. According to Save the Children, over one million people need urgent food aid across Ethiopia. The Somali region is one of the worst affected. In the past year, the malnutrition rate has jumped 64%. Much of the region's pastoral nomadic communities are on the brink of starvation. 
family say their children are getting only one meal a day. Ethiopia is Africa's second most populous country. The drought has impacted more than 8 million people. Insufficient rainfall has destroyed crops, killed livestock. The Russian invasion of Ukraine made matters worse, contributing to the rising cost of food and fuel. There is limited humanitarian response to the crisis in Ethiopia due to the lack of funds. According to experts, weather events are becoming more common and severe due to climate change. Let's shift focus to North Korea. The country is reporting a mysterious disease. At least 800 families have fallen sick. All suspected cases have been asked to quarantine. What is this mysterious disease? What are the symptoms? Also, is North Korea equipped to deal with another outbreak? North Koreans are falling sick. It's not just the Wuhan virus, but also some mysterious intestinal disease. North Korea is calling it an acute enteric epidemic. Enteric is a medical word for intestinal. Experts suspect the illness could be typhoid or cholera. At least 800 families are said to have been affected. Hospitals in Iraq's Kurdish region are on high alert. An outbreak of cholera has led to hundreds of people coming for treatment every day. All have the same symptoms. Health officials in the Kurdish region are worried by the rising number of cases. Suleimania and Erbil provinces have been hit the hardest and several people are reported to have died. We are trying as much as we can to contain the disease by providing hospitals with more medicine and medical equipment. But the number of infections is on the rise and we need additional supplies. Experts say vegetables irrigated by sewage water are behind the outbreak. Here in Baghdad, many are alarmed by contamination of drinking water and more reliance on sewage to irrigate certain vegetable farms. That is caused by water shortages in the country's lifeline twin rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. A number of cases have also been reported in the southern province of Al Muthanna. Concerns are growing that a major outbreak of the disease could put additional pressure on a national health system that is already overstretched. Now to the war in Ukraine, where an eight-year-old boy was among at least 15 people killed when Russian forces bombarded neighborhoods in and around Ukraine's second-largest city, Kharkiv. CBS's Chris Livesay is there. More Russian assaults and more Ukrainian bloodshed. Russian forces nearly captured Kharkiv before Ukraine pushed them back in May. But now, Ukraine's second largest city is once again on the front line, the regional commander tells us. We are under constant shelling. Bombs could fall any minute on any playground, backyard or apartment block. Russia continues terrorizing the local population. We saw for ourselves up close. And came to see the aftermath. The Kharkiv region is one of the hottest front lines in this war. Those booms from last night, well, one of them was a Russian missile slamming right into this community college. And we can still hear the shelling today. Shelling that stretches into the Donbass region, where Russia has captured a key village near Severodonetsk. In that city, only a chemical plant protecting soldiers and civilians remains in Ukrainian hands, according to the mayor. Vladimir, the rest Vladimir is now Rich Russia's. Putin. Vladimir Putin today vowed to strengthen his military with new weapons systems. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. Mali's army moves in but arrives too late. Three days after the attack in the Bankas commune of central Mali, the Al-Qaeda fighters are long gone. This is what is left of a once bustling market. Over the weekend, young men on motorbikes armed with machine guns fired indiscriminately. Most of the people in the village were shot dead. After days 
of continuous gunfire, there's an eerie and unsettling calm. What's lingering is the smell of charred bodies. Al-Qaeda fighters burned entire villages as families slept in their huts. Hundreds of people were killed in an attack that lasted 72 hours. An uncomfortable gathering, the survivors faced the army that has again failed to protect them. They struggled to hide their grief and anger. They had called for help in the early hours of Saturday morning. Why didn't the Malian army, that's supported by Russian fighters, intervene, wonders this man. And where were any of the 14,000 UN peacekeeping troops that have the mandate to protect them? So many questions left unanswered by the authority. While no one has claimed responsibility, Malian authorities believe the Fulani preacher Amadou Kufa, who heads a local Al-Qaeda affiliate, orchestrated the attack. This is the beginning of the rainy season and Fulani herders encroach on farmland to feed their cattle. With increasing numbers of droughts, the Malian army accuses Al-Qaeda of fermenting ethnic tensions between Fulani herders and local farmers. The number of people killed in attacks by armed groups in Mali has doubled in the last year. Attacks are spreading beyond its borders to neighboring countries. The Malian army seems overwhelmed and one step behind these armed groups that many fear are gaining ground in central Mali. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not recognizing the signs of his first coming as we read in Matthew 16, 1 through 3. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had full knowledge of the prophecies of the Messiah. Yet these religious leaders ignored the signs and still rejected him. If the religious leaders of Jesus' day missed the signs of Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to pay close attention to the signs of Jesus' second coming? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, Salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself as we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance 
and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!